Hello and welcome. The first great piece of philosophical literature I'd like to introduce you to is uh, one of the most famous in the history of philosophical literature, especially in the West, uh, and that is a little piece from Plato's Republic that has come to be known as the Allegory of the Cave. So first things first, uh, I think we very often gloss over titles. We sort of, you know, look at them just to just as a way of organizing things, and we kind of skip over them. In this case, don't do that. Um, the title of this piece is uh, quite important to how you read it. Uh, so you'll have noticed in the uh, sort of active reading text in the, the, the text that's in your uh, course module, uh, you'll notice that the green text says, wait a second, stop, you know, go look up the word allegory. And so if you do that, um, uh, which is certainly a, an important thing to do, here, here's what you'll likely find. Um, Google says something like a story, poem, or picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or political one. That certainly fits this allegory. Um, a dictionary uh, website says a representation of an abstract or spiritual meaning through concrete or material forms, uh, a figurative treatment of one subject under the guise of another, or a symbolical narrative. That, again, fits uh, this quite well. This is a, an allegory in the very standard way. The reason that philosophers call this little piece of Plato's Republic the allegory of the cave is because it is an allegory about, about a cave. Uh, philosophers are very, very good at naming things. Uh, Plato didn't give a special title to this little piece. Again, that's something that later philosophers have, have titled this little bit. This was uh, really part of a much longer work of his. So for a little bit uh, co of context, uh, let's talk a little bit about the format. I'm sure you've noticed that the allegory is a dialogue. Um, Sort of. Uh, the reason I put sort of is because the the people who are involved, uh, uh, one of the two, Socrates, is is much more. Um, uh, well, let's just say he contributes much more uh, to the dialogue. Right, Glaucon's role in this part of the Republic uh, is is uh, uh, really just to keep the dialogue going. He says things like "yes" and "I see" and "it is as you say" or stuff like that. Uh, in in other parts of the Republic, uh, the the dialogue format is much more of a dialogue, a real conversation between multiple characters. In this case, this is a, you know these are thoughts that Socrates is just just trying to get out more or less by himself. Uh, the two people involved in uh, the dialogue are uh, Socrates, who was an actual historical person, uh, is, is commonly credited with inspiring um, sort of uh, you know, Western philosophy ever since. Uh, the, you know, the philosophy prior to Socrates is very often just called pre-Socratic philosophy, uh, and afterward it's mostly just called philosophy. Um, he, uh, uh, he, he was Athenian, uh, that is, grew up in, in what is now Athens, a uh, city in Greece. Uh, he was by trade a stonemason, uh, just like his father Sophroniscus. Uh, but by the time that we, as philosophers, start paying attention to him and, and that really history starts paying attention to him, he was uh, around uh, 70 years old, approaching 70, and uh, was, you know, well, long retired from, from stonemasonry. Um, uh, in some sense, philosophy uh, was something of a retirement project for him. When he was a young man, he was uh, known for his bravery as a soldier. He fought in some historically important wars on uh, in the Greek world. Um, and in one particular story of him, he uh, uh, comported himself very well on the losing end of a battle and uh, managed to uh, retreat bravely and keep people uh, you know, sort of together and keep them alive. And, and uh, so he was, he was well known for that. Um, in some sense, he would have been a reasonably respected member of his community. But of course, uh, more details about his life and, uh, um, and, and his uh, place in Athenian society uh, will come up and be relevant later. Glaucon is the other major character uh, in this dialogue, and uh, Glaucon, also an actual historical person, was uh, in fact Plato's older brother. Uh, Plato here is the author. And I should mention that uh, pretty much all of Plato's writing comes in the form of dialogues with Socrates as the main character in these dialogues. And so as a reader, you might wonder, like, you know, how much of 
uh, what is what is what you read is stuff that Socrates actually said and how much of it is stuff that Plato just says he said and uh, the answer to that question is that there's no there's absolutely no way of knowing uh, surely uh, uh, many of these accounts are sort of you know reconstructed or, or fictionalized uh, and you know but undoubtedly they they were inspired by uh, the person of Socrates and some of the things that Socrates really did say and do uh, because some actual you know verifiable details of Socrates life are revealed in some of these dialogues but uh, there is an interesting duality here uh, Socrates himself never wrote anything um, and uh, you know it's not that he wrote things that we don't have that survived to the modern we, we he just you know we, we don't have anybody who ever said he even wrote anything including himself um, but he did have all these conversations that were apparently impactful enough to inspire an entire intellectual movement that persists to this day um, but uh, the the accounts of that, the writing, is all Plato's. But what's interesting is that Plato, who writes all of these dialogues, uh, is never a character in any of these dialogues. He never says anything himself. Uh, and so again, there's this some this, this really fun duality between Socrates, who says everything but never wrote anything, and Plato, who writes everything but never says anything. So just to uh, talk about the reading a little bit, I wanted to, again, draw your attention to um, the, the, the text itself, the way that I've supplied it to you. Uh, I've used a, a translation that's rather famous. It's a translation by a guy named Benjamin Jowett, but it's uh, uh, well over 100 years old, this translation. And so some of the, some of the language is a little bit archaic uh, compared with modern English. Uh, and so one of the things I've done is I've edited it here and there. So if you if you find a copy of the Jowett translation, you'll notice some minor differences here and there. And mostly those are just differences to make the text a little bit sound a little bit more like modern English. Um, and those are those are my own additions. Um, and uh, you'll also notice in the reading that you have, you'll notice this green text that's uh, uh, that's uh, you know sort of in, in various places. Let me get my laser pointer out. You'll see it here and here and here. Uh, that's also my edition as your instructor. And my purpose in this is to encourage you to uh, read actively, um, so that uh, uh, th that is to think about what you're reading while you're reading. Uh, and it's one thing to say to people, think about what you're reading while you're reading. It's another thing to actually show people what that means. And I think you, you have to, as an instructor, do that before you can expect people to, to know what you mean. Uh, and so that's what I've tried to do in this, in this reading here. And I'll add some things like this to a couple of later readings in the course, but eventually I'll taper off and present you just the readings as they are, um, because it'll be your turn to then, you know, read actively. I, if I supplied this sort of active reading advice to every document, well, you wouldn't be actively reading. You would be, you, you know, I'd be doing all, all of that for you. Uh, it's such an important skill, especially for uh, interpreting philosophical writing, uh, that that's why I've, I've, I've tried to model it here so that you can uh, try and pick up where it leaves off as we go on. So let's start in on the dialogue itself. Um, and uh, so Socrates, you know, he says, be, you know, and now he says, let me show in a figure how far our nature is enlightened or unenlightened, right? So when he says in a figure, right, he, he means, he's, he's saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be symbolic here. I'm going to use figurative language, okay? So here's how he puts it. He says, behold, human beings living in an underground den, which has a mouth open toward the light, and reaching all along the den, here they have been with their childhood, and have their legs neck and necks chained so that they cannot move and can only see in front of them, being prevented by the chains from turning their heads around. Above and behind them is a fire, blazing at a distance, and between the fire and the prisoners there is a raised way, and you will see, if you look, a low wall built along the way, like the screen which marionette players have in front of them, over which they show the puppets. And do you see men passing along the wall, carrying all sorts of containers, statues and figures of animals made of wood and stone and various materials which appear over the wall? Some of them are talking, others silent. And Glaucon here contributes, you have shown me a strange image, and they are strange prisoners. Well, let's try and visualize this a little bit here. So the first thing we need is a cave. That's how you, that's how you draw a cave on a PowerPoint, right? 
good great and uh, then remember uh, the other things that he said was in there there was there's a, a row of prisoners okay uh, there they are they're 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 chained right so that they can only uh, sort of look forward uh, so if you imagine all all of those you know chains and everything as as chaining up the uh, the prisoners keeping them so they can only face forward uh, and then there's a wall right and 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 there's a fire blazing behind the wall at a distance and then there's this raised way behind the wall where where there are people walking along and uh, carrying things like you know statues of a statue of a kitty cat or this nice greek urn showing things right um yeah so so that's um you know and again it says some of them are talking and and, and others are silent and uh, to this glaucon replies you have shown me a strange image and they are strange prisoners socrates response is uh, very instructive here he says like ourselves Um, and this this is a, a, a an important time to stop and think, right? It's like, okay, whenever somebody tells a story uh, of this kind, where where there's a you know a parable or a fable or something like that, it's an allegory, right? Uh, that there are people in it or, or characters. You, you're supposed to, in general, imagine yourself as as one of those characters, and and sometimes it's really clear who you're supposed to imagine yourself as, and sometimes it isn't, uh, and sometimes the the author uh, will sort of pull pull the rug out from under and says look you were picturing yourself as this character but really really you're this one right um in this case right it's hard to predict it's hard to picture who you're supposed to be if you're even picturing yourself in in here somewhere uh, maybe you're picturing yourself as socrates right the person telling the story i don't know um that would be heroic indeed but no picture yourself we're supposed to picture ourselves as one of the prisoners the prisoners are like us and when you when he puts it that way you, you start thinking wait a second in what way is my life like that because you know i'll bet you don't think it is right and so uh, again it's going to be a kind of metaphorical thing of course unless you literally grew up in a cave and tie were tied up and and, and fa forced to face in one direction with a fire etc mm -hmm. unless you literally grew up this way uh this this isn't it's not literal okay so uh, it, you have to start thinking in what way are they like us and what way are we like them and so he explains a bit. He says, and they see only their own shadows or the shadows of one another, which the fire throws on the opposite wall of the cave. Glaucon agrees. He says, true. How could they see anything but the shadows if they were never allowed to move their heads? And Socrates says, and of the objects that are being carried in like manner, they would only see the shadows. Glaucon agrees. Yes, Socrates. And if they were able to converse with one another, Socrates continues, would they not suppose that they were naming what was actually before them? Okay. And suppose further that the prison had an echo which came from the other side, would they not be sure to fancy when one of the passers-by spoke that the voice which they heard came from the shadow? Glaucon says, well, no question. And Socrates says, so the prisoners would believe that the shadows of the images were literally the truth. And Glaucon agrees, that is certain. So this is the sense in which the prisoners are like us. Um, and it has to do with, with what light and shadow is doing here. Uh, again, light uh, is, is going to be symbol, a symbolic of knowledge or truth all the way through the allegory. And that's a fairly common symbology. Uh, lots of stories, lots of, of, of parables uh, use, use light to stand in for sort of knowledge. Uh, I mean, there's a reason why we, the word enlightenment has light in it, right? It's, 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 um, the, 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 the parallel is clear. Um, in this case, then, the shadows are going to be the opposite of knowledge and truth. They're going to stand for falsehoods. And so what's what's going on is that from the perspective of the prisoners, right, they know what they see. They have the things they see. Here's, you know, the shadow of this urn. Maybe this is the shadow of the kitty cat. And notice, these are shadows by firelight, right? So a shadow by firelight is not going to be a, a crisp and distinct thing. Uh, you know, like a like a like a shadow puppet or something like that. It's going to be hazy. It's going to be be indistinct. Uh, it's going to flicker around. It's it's going to be very very difficult to interpret. Um, but th because that's the only game in town, 
uh, this is this is what the prisoners will talk about. This is what they will think about, uh, and this is what they think there will be. So imagine, you know, uh, this guy here. You know, it's like imagine he's like going meow meow or something like that. I mean, again, if it's an echoey cave, uh, you know, Socrates points out, look, these people might even think that it's the shadow making the sound and not 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 anything else. And when they name objects, right? When they when they when they think about what things really are, they will think about the shadows. And so the suggestion that Socrates is making is actually really quite radical. He's saying that that what what's going on with us, you and you and I, human beings, is that the sorts of things that we think are true, the sorts of things that we think are real, are 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 not right. Is that they're they're pale shadows. They're 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 flickery shadows by firelight. Uh, uh, you know. So what he's saying is that our understanding of things, our understanding of truths, is is very very much removed from the truth itself. Right. There's there's only there's only a little tiny bit of it in there, and we don't realize it, just as these prisoners don't realize the limits of their own situation. And so the, uh, the the dialogue goes in phases. And uh, whenever Socrates says, you know, sort of now imagine, you know, or, or in this case he says, now look again, right? So again, that's 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 phase two here. So now look again and see what will naturally follow, he says, if the prisoners are released and disabused of their error. At first, when any of them is liberated and compelled suddenly to stand up and turn his neck round and walk and look toward the firelight, he will suffer sharp pains. The glare will distress him, and he will be unable to see those shadows that used to be the only things he thought there were. Right. So one of the things that's great about this, uh, you know, is that is this, this allegory works on multiple levels. So, uh, so look, we've 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 released one of the prisoners here, right? And we've we've sort of forced him to look back here at the fire to to see the people carrying the objects, right? To see something other than the shadows, in other words. And uh, Socrates does not give this prisoner name, but for for ease of uh, reference, we're just going to refer to him as as Biff because it's my go-to fake name, uh, and. And and so that that'll that'll make things easier for us. So 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 Biff is over here. And look, you've all experienced where you know if you're in a dark room or you know first thing in the morning somebody turns a light on, it it it's really unpleasant. You're like ah, you know it it kind of hurts. You know you 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 want to close your eyes till they get used to the. Light. It's 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 deeply unpleasant. But again, that's literally true. That that light when you're in a dark place will sort of hurt your eyes, and and make it hard to see things. But again, remember the symbolism here, because it's not just literally true, but it's also figuratively true. It's what makes this such a powerful and, and, and enduring metaphor. So if if the light stands for knowledge, stands for enlightenment, as you will, right, as a wisdom, that sort of thing, uh, then what's going on is, 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 if you remember what Socrates said right at the beginning, he says, this is about education, right? This whole this whole thing, it's about education. It's about, it's about our nature and, and how far it is enlightened or unenlightened. It's about learning things. And, uh, you know, he's pointing out that as we approach the light, right, that is, you know, as we, we see something that's more real or more true, it's unpleasant at first. It makes it harder to see other things. It, um, it can hurt, right? And, 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 and we'll, we, we want to turn away, right? We want to close our eyes. And he's saying this, 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 this is a fact about human nature, right, that, that, that he thinks that we, we sort of, you know, turn away sometimes uh, from knowledge because it's unpleasant. And of course, education really is that way. It's difficult. It's a lot of work. Um, lots of times somebody kind of has to make you do it. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not always entertaining. Um, you know, sometimes it's, it's a real slog to learn things. Um, now, of course, not everything in life has to be entertaining to be valuable, but, uh, but it, it does sometimes make it harder. Uh, when when something isn't you know all you know isn't isn't all fun and games and learning is very often not all fun and games. So let's continue. Um, so he will be unable, meaning Biff. Biff will be unable to see those shadows that used to be the only things he thought there were. Then imagine somebody saying to him that what he saw before was an illusion. 
but that now, when he is approaching nearer to being, and his eye is turned toward more real existence, he has a clearer vision. What will be his reply? And you may further imagine that his instructor is pointing to the objects as they pass, requiring him to name them. Will he not be perplexed? Will he not fancy that the shadows which he formerly saw are truer than the objects which are now shown to him? Glaucon replies, far truer. Socrates then continues, he says, and if he is compelled to look straight at the light, will he not have a pain in his eyes which will make him turn away and take in the objects of vision which he can see, and which he will think to be in reality clearer than the things which are now being shown to him? And so again, this is a really important message about learning, about education, because Again, imagine yourself in Biff's place. You really are supposed to think of yourself as as as, as the, this sort of Biff-like character here, uh, or at least one of the prisoners. And you know, imagine you're 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 pointing to these objects. You're pointing to the, the urn, the kitty cat statue. And you're saying, saying, "What are those? Name those!" Like how he's gonna he's gonna be like, "I I don't know." He's, he's gonna feel ridiculous, right? He's gonna you know he's gonna feel like he doesn't know anything. You know, then you say, "Well, what about those? The shadows?" And like, well, once you've looked at the firelight, how could you even see those shadows anymore, right? I mean, it's you know, uh, he's. Biff, there's going to be a lag, right? He's going to believe for a while that the old views were the best. And it will take him quite a while of unpleasant pain and effort to learn otherwise. But imagine that he does, right? Imagine that he, he, he puts in the work, he deals with the unpleasantness, and he manages to come to grips with the reality of his situation. Well, we go a little further. Phase three. Socrates says, and suppose once more that he is reluctantly dragged up a steep and rugged ascent. That's how you draw a steep and rugged ascent on a, on a PowerPoint. And held securely until he is forced into the presence of the sun himself. Is he not likely to be pained and irritated? When he approaches the light, his eyes will be dazzled. He will not be able to see anything at all of what are now called realities. Glaucon agrees, not right away. Right? Socrates continues, he says, he will need to grow accustomed to the sight of the upper world. At first, he will see the shadows best. Next, the reflections of men and other objects in the water. Then the objects themselves. Then he will gaze upon the light of the moon and the stars and the spangled heaven. And he will see the sky and the stars by night better than the sun or the light of the sun by day. And last of all, he'll be able to see the sun, not merely reflections of him, uh, him meeting the sun, right? Uh, this is one of those passages that would be so much clearer if the author didn't use, uh, a, or if the translator or whoever didn't use pronouns, but instead just, you know, used, so you say Biff, right? So, uh, but he, meaning Biff, will see him, meaning the sun, in his, the sun's own proper place and not in another. And he, Biff, will contemplate him, the sun, as he, the sun, is, right? Uh, so, uh, again, for, for ancient people, yes, the sun was a he, right? Um, uh, more modern translations will, will use the term it for the sun, so it makes those passages a little bit clearer, but, but not a whole bunch. And so, you know, Socrates then, then concludes, he says, so Biff will then uh, proceed to argue that it is the sun that gives the season and the years and is the guardian of all that is in the visible world. And in a certain way, the cause of all things which Biff and his fellows have been accustomed to behold. And Glaucon agrees. He says, clearly, the prisoner would first see the sun and then reason about it. And so notice, uh, again, this is one of these, uh, this is this is one of these places where the metaphor works not just figuratively but literally as well uh, i mean again if you are in a cave lit only by firelight for basically ever and then all of a sudden you're in the presence of the sun again your eyes are going to hurt you're not going to be able to see things very well it's going to be disorienting it's going to be unpleasant again just like learning new things so it seems as if learning new things never becomes easier you just learn bigger new things Right. Uh, like, I, I, you know, 
Uh, there, there are a lot of sayings about this. I have a, a you know, friend of mine who's a, a cyclist and says, cycling doesn't get easier, it just gets faster, right? Uh, again, you know, the, the idea is that as you're able to do harder things, you do harder things. And so it never really gets easier, but you do get better. And so uh, we're, it doesn't get any easier to learn new truths, but the truths we're learning get bigger and bigger and more important. And so we see that in this transition between a firelight, which is a very small kind of a light, and the sun, right? One of the very biggest kinds of the lights like this is the real stuff the big stuff and of course uh you know you, you see the rest of the outside world you know the trees and all that stuff and, and this is a picture of my dog so there you go um so, you know stuff in the real world and so so he, here he is up in the upper world our world okay and it takes him a while but imagine again he puts in the work he he comes to grips with the reality the the new the new reality of his situation and this is the part of the dialogue. This is the meanwhile back at the ranch section of the dialogue. So Socrates asks, he says, when he remembered his old life and the, and, and the quote unquote wisdom of the cave and his fellow prisoners, do you not suppose that he would be happy about his change and pity them? And if they were in the habit of conferring honors among themselves on those who were quickest to observe the passing shadows and to remark which of them went before, which of them followed after, which were together, and who were therefore best able to draw conclusions as to the future, do you think that he would care for such honors and glories or envy the possessors of them? And I think this is a real question. I think it's a question we should definitely consider because it'll certainly become relevant soon. Uh, again, imagine that, you know, you've got, you know, these these folks here. What do they talk about? Well, of course, the shadows. What else have they got? There's, you know, it's, it's no cable, right? And and so, you know, imagine some of them probably are pretty good at remembering, you know, which shadows came f first and which came second and which were associated with other ones. And so could sort of generalize and, and you make predictions as to the future. And, you know, maybe there are some, some titles of honor that are used here. Maybe one of some of these prisoners called the other one, like, you know, the, the uh, super dude or something like that, whatever. I mean, and, and they, there's this, this social respect that comes along with being able to do these things and name the shadows. And and now now again you know once upon a time as Biff is imagine Biff as as a, a young child, right? Uh, would Biff have 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 looked up to these these other sort of social heroes? Uh, almost certainly. But again now right? Imagine him now. Looking back, right? As Socrates says, I repeat, he says, "Do you think he would care for such honors and glories, or envy the possessors of them?" And uh, you know, both 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 Socrates and Glaucon agree he would not, right? Um, in fact, you know, Socrates says, w would he not say with with Homer, as a famous quote here, better to be a poor servant of a poor master than to endure and, and to, to endure anything rather than live the way they live and think as they do. And so on that note, uh, we have to do something here um, that I do every semester that we cover this, and I feel bad about it every time. And uh, so we, we owe Biff an apology here, um, but we're, we're, we're going to do the inevitable. Uh, we, have to, we have to send him back into the cave with his form. Imagine once more, Socrates says, such a one coming suddenly out of the sun to be replaced in his old situation. Would he not be certain to have his eyes full of darkness? Glaucon agrees. He would surely not see well. And Socrates says, and if there were a contest and he had to compete in measuring the shadows with the prisoners who had never moved out of the den while his sight was still weak, and before his eyes had become steady, and the time which would be needed to acquire this new habit of sight might be very considerable. Would he not be ridiculous? Men would say of him that up he went and down he came without his eyes, and that it was better not to even think of ascending. So let us then imagine, right? I mean, what is Biff going to say here? 
I, I mean, just imagine yourself in this situation, talking to people who've never moved out of the den. He's going to say, no, 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 no. These, these, these shadows here, these, they're not real, right? I mean, I guess they're real shadows, but they, but they're, they're just, they're just shadows, right? And, and, and trying to explain what a shadow is to somebody who's never seen the light directly, uh, you know, and, and, and it's this. Um, it seems so difficult and, and, you know, uh, and, and he's going to sound crazy to them. He's going to sound utterly crazy to them. And I, I want you to think at this point about some of the stereotypes that, that you, you know, you have, or that you've heard other people have, uh, toward very highly educated people, right? And you hear people say things like this. You'll, you'll hear them say things like, oh, well, you know, um, all that book learning, you know, sort of just is so impractical or that's it's it's head in the clouds, pie in the sky, up in an ivory tower somewhere. Um, a person may have book smarts, but they don't have street smarts or, you know, they, they've got all this learning, but no common sense. Right. Or, you know, you've got all these sorts of things. I've, I've, I've heard them all. I've seen them all. Um, but but what is that? Other than an attempt to judge the wise by the standards of the foolish. And we can expect Biff to face just exactly that kind of judgment here. All right, they're going to think he's nuts. They're going to think he's impractical. They're going to think his perspectives are useless to them. And you should be warned before you decide to embark on learning anything that it will change who you are. It will change what you think is important. But looking at this metaphor here, that's that's good, right? Uh, uh, what you think is important should be more informed by the way things really are, as opposed to the way things that you have simply always seen them from your limited perspective. Um, so you know clearly, right? We see this situation, that, and, and and finally, Biff probably is gonna 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 want to give up, right? Uh, you know, he he's gonna say, look, look, just just okay, he's just just look, come with me, I'll show you. Right. And he's like telling you is just not going to work. Right. It's, it's just there's too much to say. Right. You have to experience this for yourself, which is true. Right. Just because you tell somebody something does not mean they know that thing. Um, and so, yeah, you, you have to help people experience something for themselves. You have to help people teach themselves. Right. Um, that's how learning always works. Right. A, a teacher can show somebody how to learn something or can recommend them something to learn. But but only only each individual person can make themselves learn a thing. And so uh, uh, Socrates puts it this way. He says, again, imagine how they would react. Socrates says, and, and if anyone tried to unchain another prisoner, lead him up into the light, let them only catch the offender and they would put him to death. Right. And of course, from their perspective, they have all kinds of reasons. Right. You know, it, it, also in the dialogue, it talks about, you know, asking asking the uh, the prisoner to, to to name the shadows. Right. And, you know, and of course, you know, he's, he's going to say something like, look, man, I can't see Jack down here. I'll be perfectly honest with you. It's like and, and really the shadows are they're nothing. Right. They're just they're it, don't worry about the shadows. And of course, you know, it's, say that to these people, like, don't worry about the shadows. What are you talking about? That's all that there is. Uh, and of course, they're wrong. Again, there's there's all these attempts, right, to judge the, the the wise by the standards of the foolish, and simply because the foolish are more numerous, they seem to carry the day. So it's at this point, right, where where Socrates puts it this way: he says, "Look, if anyone tried to unchain another prisoner, lead him up into the light, let them only catch the offender, and they would put him to death." All right. So Plato here is is referring to actual events in Socrates's life. And so it is at this point where some uh, details about Socrates' life, uh, especially the end of his life, uh, start to become relevant, uh, and I'm sure you'll, you'll see the parallels. And so the text that is over here on the right, uh, and, and, and that will continue to be on some of these slides here, uh, is from a, a different writing of Plato's uh, called uh, Apology, right? And uh, the moderns, when, when, in modern English, when most of the time when somebody uses the word apology, they're use, they, they mean something like, oh, I'm sorry, or I have something to apologize for. The, the word apology in English comes from the Greek word apologia, which means, a, which means defense. Right. Um, and so when so in the title apology here, in this case, we're talking about defense. And in this case, it's quite literal. So 
uh, Socrates is being is, is in court uh, in Athens. He is being charged with the crime of corrupting the youth. And the way that trials worked in Athens is that uh, somebody would lay a charge in public, right? And then, uh, you know, there'd be some time for everyone to, you know, prepare their stuff. And then the people laying the charge would give a speech. Very often they would hire a speech writer. Um, it's kind of like the, the ancient equivalent of getting a lawyer, right? To sort of help you through uh, making your case as effectively as you can. And then, of course, the defendant, the person accused of something, would also then generally hire a speech writer, make their speech, you know, and then there would be some haggling over, over the, the details. And, and then what, what would happen is that all the citizens who were present in, in court on that day uh, would vote, right, uh, guilty or innocent, and then uh, would vote on, on the punishment. And so, uh, so again, Socrates is here, and he's being charged with the crime of corrupting the youth. And so uh, the, the, uh, the writing called Apology is, is it's the speech that Socrates gave in his own defense. Now, one important thing to remember here, Socrates, uh, contrary to common practice of the time, did not hire a speech writer. He decided to, again, represent himself in court, which, as you know, always comes with certain risks. Um, but uh, he felt, you know, he could make his own case better than anyone could uh, advise him how to make his own case. And so this is this is the this is his own story, right? So he's he's going to tell the story of how he got interested uh, in philosophy, why how he came to be charged with this crime, and why he doesn't think he's really guilty of any crime. And so he starts the story this way. He says, "Well, Chaerophon, as you know, this is a friend of his. Uh, Chaerophon, as you know, was very impetuous in all his doings, and he went to Delphi." and boldly asked the oracle to tell him whether there was anyone wiser than I was. And the Pythian prophetess answered that there was, uh, answered that there was no man wiser. Okay, so pause here for a second. This here is actually a, a picture of the, the sort of modern ruins of the oracle at Delphi. Um, and essentially the oracle, you know, its pur purpose was, you know, people could go and ask, right, the, the prophets and the priestesses and stuff. They could ask uh, to get prophecy, to get, that it's, to get answers to questions from, from the gods, specifically Apollo. Um, and, uh, you know, usually... Uh, when the oracle gave answers, they were kind of riddles, right? They were a little cagey about stuff, right? There's one famous incident in which, you know, someone says, you know, what will happen if we invade Persia? And, you know, they said, a great empire will fall. It's like, well, that's kind of ambiguous, right? Um, it, that's the sort of, it's very, very crafty, very cagey. That's usually the kind of thing you get out of the oracle. And so this is this is a bit of a weird story, right? And so um, the guy asks, is there anyone wiser than my friend Socrates? And they said, no, <laughs> there's no man wiser. Like, what? What? Um, and so when, when Socrates hears of this, he doesn't believe it, right? So I, you know, it's, I said to myself, what can the god mean? He, he's thinking it's got to be some kind of a riddle that just doesn't sound like a riddle. Maybe that's the riddle, right? And so he says, what's the implication of this riddle? For I know that I have no wisdom, small or great. What can he mean when he says that I am the wisest of men? And yet he is a god and cannot lie. That would be against his nature. After long consideration, I at last thought of a method of trying the question. I reflected that if I could only find a man wiser than myself, then I might go to the god with a refutation in my hand. So this becomes something of a retirement project for Socrates. He decides to go around and try and find somebody who's wiser than he is so that he can then, you know, go go back to the oracle and say, hey, look, see, you know, I've, I've got your, you know, I've, I've solved the riddle, right? You know, you, you really just meant for me to find this wise person, something like that, right? And so what proceeds is this... Um, this this these, these series of conversations these dialogues that that are, are largely recorded right in uh, in in uh, what are called you know Plato's dialogues right so there's all these conversations that Socrates has with all kinds of people most often in public and so Socrates puts it this way he says accordingly I went to one who had the reputation of wisdom and when I began to talk with him I could not help thinking that he was not really wise, although he was thought wise by many and wiser still by himself. And I went and tried to explain to him that he, he thought himself wise, but was not really wise. And that the consequence was that he hated me and his enmity was shared by several who were present and heard me. 
So I left him, saying to myself as I went away, well, although I do not suppose that either of us knows anything really beautiful and good, I am better off than he is, for he knows nothing and thinks that he knows. I neither know nor think that I know. In this latter particular, then, I seem to have slightly the advantage of him. Then I went to another, who had still higher philosophical pre uh, pretensions, and my conclusion was exactly the same. I made another enemy of him, and of many others besides him. Right. And so this, again, describes this, this, this process of dialogue, of questioning things, again, publicly, of, of demanding justification. Right? This is one of the things that is so uh, inspiring about, about Socrates as a figure and what, what inspires uh, the philosophical method to this day is this, this demand for, for rational argument. Right? Uh, it says, okay, if you think something, well, well, don't you have to have some good reason to think so? Uh, don't you have to have considered all of the problems that there might be with your view? Um, you know, don't you have to have some reasonable answer to those things if you're going to you know say that you you know believe this that or the other thing um and, and and again it's a very inspiring way to to go about life but you might imagine again if if you're the person who's being questioned by this old this old retired stonemason uh that you you might get irritated right it might it's very annoying to right find out that something that you thought that you had a really good handle on is something that you maybe didn't know very much at all um and uh, I, I think nobody likes confronting their own ignorance. Uh, I think, though, you, you can you can get used to it, right? And eventually you can get over it, get over yourself. Um, but uh, certainly people didn't react well. And uh, and that then Socrates, you know, tells tells it as it is. So uh, this this picture here is actually uh, uh, the, the this the the picture here is from Raphael's painting uh, the School of Athens and this is actually zoomed way in right here's Socrates right and uh, depicted as talking to a bunch of people right having these again these conversations these dialogues uh, the School of Athens uh, is is a huge huge painting I encourage you to Google it and look at it and, and uh, uh, find an explainer to to point out all the different people and figures and stuff that are in it and the context and it the whole painting tells like a whole bunch of stories it's really Really, really remarkable so um uh yeah anyway, renaissance arts uh, can, can can occasionally be very very cool but let's continue with uh, with socrates of defense so it's not just that that he made an enemy of some probably very influential uh probably you know very um you know uh uh uh, sort of bigwig people, people who thought that they were important, maybe people that other people thought were important. He, you know, not only got their enmity, but but he, you know, made things worse by, by, well, here's the factor. And so, Socrates not didn't just you know do this all by himself. Uh, you know, one of the things happened since a lot of these conversations occurred in public, uh, he had something of an audience in most places, and and he puts it this way. He says, "There's another thing." Okay. He says, young men of the richer classes who have not much to do, um, you know, the sort of idle rich, as it were, he says, they come to, they come about me, they hang around me, right, of their own accord. Um, they like to hear the pretenders examined. They often imitate me and examine others themselves. There are plenty of persons, as they soon enough discover, who think that they know something, but really know little or nothing. And, and then those who are examined by them, instead of being angry with themselves, are angry with me <laughs> this confounded socrates they say this villainous misleader of the youth right and of course this is what leads to the, the thing he's charged with right is it's corrupting the youth right because again imagine right so you've got this this old codger like you know um uh, sort of making making some wise, important, you know, uh, very certainly self-important people look foolish in public uh, by sort of examining their knowledge and finding them wanting, uh, you know, sort of outsmarting them and, and you know, sh sort of showing them up. And I mean, what young person does not like to see the mighty brought low, does not like to poke fun uh, at all the, you know, sort of fusty pomposity of the older generation, uh, you know, all these important men, right? And, of course, they loved it. They, uh, uh, young people loved it then. They will love it now. Uh, you know, we're all we're still human beings, right? You know, even two and a half thousand years later. And so, uh, uh, this is one of the things that's sort of important to the story is is all of Socrates' friends, all these people, these young people that follow him around, like Plato, right? Um, this is a, from a painting uh, called a, a, a Socrates' Last Interview with His Friends, right? It's a Charles Fraser painting. It's a, again, it's very um, 
it's a, it's a very sort of moving scene here. Um, you'll see you'll see why it's sort of so moving when you find out what happened to Socrates. But now you see why he was charged with what he was charged with, charged with corrupting the youth. And, uh, you know, he's sort of explained that. Uh, but, but, you know, things go on. So one of the things that happens at an Athenian trial is that there's some haggling over over a punishment, right? So if you charge somebody with something, then you, you say, here's what ought to happen to them, right, if they're guilty. And as part of the defense, they say, look, I'm, you know, I'm not guilty. I mean, you shouldn't, you know, vote, vote against me. I'm not guilty. But, you know, if, if you, you know, if you had to, there's here's this other thing. You could do this instead, you know, like alternate punishment maybe, right? So the person charging him, um, a guy named Miletus, uh, uh, you know, proposed exile, right? That is, he'd just be kicked out of Athens, right? And, uh, you know, Socrates had a different proposal. It was a little, it was, he was pretty cheeky about it. He says uh, he proposed that he be put on the public payroll because he was doing a public service, right? So this is actually what he says about that. He says, look, he says, I would have you know, right, that if you kill such a one as I am, right, because here's the thing, if, if you exile somebody and they don't leave, and certainly Socrates had no intention of leaving, well, then you sort of have to kill them. And that's, Socrates knew the stakes here, right? So he says, I would have you know that if you kill such a one as I am, you will injure yourselves more than you injure me. For if you kill me, you will not easily find another like me, who, if I may use such a ludicrous figure of speech, am a sort of gadfly given to the state by the god. And the state is like a great and noble steed who is tardy in his motions owing to his very size, and requires to be stirred into life. I am that gadfly which God has given the state, and all day long and in all places am always fastening upon you, arousing and persuading, reproaching you. And as you will not easily find another like me, I would advise you to spare me. I dare say that you may feel irritated at being suddenly awakened when you are caught napping. And you may think that if you were to strike me dead as Anitus advises, which you easily might, then you would sleep on for the remainder of your lives, unless God in his care of you gives you another gadfly. He's being a little cheeky here, but I mean, he's suggesting something that is, is you know, pretty profound. He's saying, look, yes, it's unpleasant to have to confront, you know, the things you haven't thought carefully enough about. It's it's unpleasant to realize that you might have been wrong or some, about something or that you hadn't thought through something as carefully as you should have. And the person who's pointing that out to you, yeah, it's really easy just to sort of turn against that person and think of them as an enemy. But they're not. Right. Uh, they're doing they're doing you a favor. Right. And, and, and annoying though it is. Right. You're really better off with this kind of a person around. And that's what he's saying. He's saying you, you, you we'd all be better off with someone around who, who's comfortable challenging us. Right. Instead of just uh, going along with uh, with the, 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 the false images that we have of what reality is really like. Now, um, as it turns out, it's a, it was a fairly close vote, um, but by you know, around 30-ish votes uh, or so, um, they, uh, the, the vote does come out guilty, right? Um, a lot of people expected that Socrates would then sort of flee. He doesn't. He stays. He takes his punishment. He essentially, you know, uh, takes death right as his punishment. He drinks the poison of his own free will. Um, and uh, that's uh, this is this is that's what this uh, image here depicts here. This is uh, from uh, Jacques Louis David um, from a, a painting called Death of Socrates. It's a, um, again uh, it's a tremendous work of work of art, but but also illustrates this very poignant moment. And uh, there's a, another. Um, uh, you know, there, 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 there are other dialogues that that, that have uh, that depict some of the conversations that Socrates has after his trial, and again, they're they're profound and interesting and, and philosophically important as well. Um, but this is what what uh, Socrates says to the court uh, upon upon hearing of the the verdict. He says this. He says, "O judges, be of good cheer about death, and know this of a truth: that no evil can happen to a good man either in life or after death." He and his are not neglected by the gods, nor has my own approaching end happened by mere chance. But I see clearly that to die and be released was better for me, and therefore the oracle gave no sign, for which reason also I'm not angry with my accusers or my condemners. They have done me no harm, although neither of them meant to do me any good, and for this I may gently blame them. Still, I have a favor to ask of them. When my sons are grown up, I would ask you, O oh, my friends, to punish them. 
and I would have you trouble them as I have troubled you, if they seem to care about riches or anything more than about virtue, or if they pretend to be something when they are really nothing, then reprove them as I have reproved you for not caring about that for which they ought to care and thinking that they are something when they are really nothing. And if you do this, I and my sons will have received justice at your hands. Right. Well, while Socrates does gently blame his condemners and his accusers, uh, I think Plato's doing a little more here. And in many of his dialogues, in many places in the Republic, and including this part of uh, uh, the uh, the allegory of the cave, uh, Socrates, or, sorry, Plato is not really missing an opportunity to rub his fellow Athenians' noses in the fact that their fickleness, their short-sightedness, um, and their their you know foolishness uh, caused them to lose their very best. And so here we are, back in the cave. And Socrates explains himself a bit. He says, to this, this entire allegory, you may now add, dear Glaucon, to the previous argument. The prison house is the world of sight. The light of the fire is the sun. And you will not misunderstand me if you interpret the journey upwards to be the ascent of the mind into the intellectual world, according to my poor belief, which at your desire I have expressed. Whether rightly or wrongly, God knows. But whether true or false, my opinion is that in the world of knowledge, the idea of the good appears last of all. And it is only with an effort, right? And, and when seen, it's also inferred to be the universal author of all things beautiful and right, parent of light and the Lord of light in this visible world, and the immediate source of reason and truth in the intellectual world. And that this is the power upon which he who would act rationally, either in public or private, must have his eye fixed. And anyone who has common sense will remember that the bewilderments of the eyes are of two kinds and arise from two causes, either from coming out of the light or from going into the light, which is true of the mind's eye quite as much as of the bodily eye. And he who remembers this when he sees anyone whose vision is perplexed and weak should not be too ready to laugh. He will first ask whether that one has come out of the brighter light and is unable to see because unaccustomed to the dark, or, having turned from darkness to the day, is dazzled by an excess of light. And he will count the first one happy in his condition and state of being, and he will pity the other. Or, at least, if he have a mind to laugh at the one that comes from below into the light, there will be more reason in this than the laugh which greets him who returns above, out of the light, into the den. And so again, I'll leave you to, uh, to see the, the, the parallels of Socrates' own life on this particular lesson. Sure, Sometimes the people who have they who've been up and have come back, right, may say things that seem a little ridiculous, right? They they may say some things, they may they may have some perspectives that seem ludicrous or, you know, or weird or, or hard to understand, right? But uh, whenever somebody seems confused, you should always stop and consider: Are they confused because they're they're learning, they're coming up out of the darkness? And if you laugh at them, that's a little bit good natured, right? That's there's something good going on. They're coming up into the light. And it's, you know, going to take them a little while, but they'll get there. Or do they seem confused because they're coming out of the light, into the darkness, and you're the one in the darkness? And then if you laugh at them, well, maybe there's not so much reason for that. Maybe you need to come out, out, out of the darkness yourself. So there are two important themes that I want you to take out of this particular piece of writing. There, there are many, many, many themes in the Allegory of the Cave, and I think you can take many out of it. But I, I want to focus on two of them uh, just, for the, just for this course, just for now. The first is that, that as you go through this course, there are going to be many things that will strike you as bizarre, useless, or even just absurd. Right? It's going to happen, I can guarantee it. Just 
remember the allegory. Remember Biff standing before his fellows, right? Remember the two kinds of, of confusions, right, that, that, that uh, Plato talks about in the, the end of the allegory. Uh, just go with it, all right? Just, just, just go with it. Two, and this is, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about this, but it is, unfortunately, as far as I can tell, how reality works. Um, an increase in knowledge or wisdom does not come with greater confidence, right? Quite the contrary. And and think about think about Biff's journey here. You know, for his entire life, he sees only the shadows. And so he's going to be very, very confident that he knows just exactly what, what the world is like, what there is to it, and, and everything about it. And then he's shown that he was wrong about all of it. Not just a little wrong, but very wrong, substantially wrong. And just when he's gotten comfortable with, 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 with the fire in the cave, with the way and the statues and the people walking behind the wall and all that stuff, by the time he, he's, he's comfortable saying, okay, that's, I can see why I thought what I thought before, but now I see what's real. I see what the actual objects are. Then just as soon as he gets comfortable with that, he gets, he gets it all upended all over again. Take, he gets taken into the upper world. It's like, oh no, none of that stuff was really all there was either, right? Now we've got these trees and the animals and the lights in the sky and the sun and the earth, right? And all of these things. And, and again, it takes him a long time to become comfortable with those. But just as soon as he does, do you suppose he's going to be all, oh, yep, totally got it now? Not if he's smart, right? Uh, his entire world has already been upended twice. Why shouldn't it yet get upended again? Why should the things he thinks now have any more reason to be completely right than the things he was just absolutely certain of at earlier points in his life. Right? The more times you replace a worse idea with a better one, the more comfortable you become with a procedure. And the more likely you are to think, well, I guess the the, the you know the idea that I have now that I've already replaced several times, it, it might just get replaced again. And I'm, in fact, I'm looking for it to get replaced again. Right? Um, that 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 tends to that is sometimes perceived as a lack of confidence. But what it really is, is just wisdom, right? So again, wisdom and, and knowledge, don't they don't come with greater confidence, right? That's um, something that you just should know going in. Um, but rather, knowledge and wisdom are going to come with, with quite the opposite, quite a lot of uncertainty. Um, that's, just, um, that's just the way it is. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way, and I'm sure neither would Plato. Uh, 